church and I'll go to mine But let's walk along together Our fathers built them side by side So let's walk along together Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Manaway Center Christian Church. We're so glad that you joined us this morning. We are a community seeking to have open minds and open hearts and open arms to a world in need. Family, we are apart but bound together through the ties of the Holy Spirit. Be blessed, be encouraged, and trust that God is near in this time. Today is the first Sunday in Lent. It is a season of reflection and repentance and to walk with Jesus to Holy Week. Together, we're going to be learning at Jesus' feet about how we as disciples might live the resurrection. Jesus' ministry was a ministry of new life and resurrection. And through his words, his actions, his parables, we learn what that looks like in the world, how we are to be in the world. Today we're going to look at a very familiar passage from many of us, the gospel in the Gospel of Luke called the Good Samaritan. Um, in it, we're going to explore the ways that compassion can make an immediate impact, but also an even bigger impact, a big picture impact on the world around us. We are called to live the re resurrection, and we're going to want to take every bit of of Jesus' teachings on compassion with us. So then, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let's take a deep breath. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. And let's light a candle to remind us that God is with us and that we are bound together in the Holy Spirit. Family, together we have set this time and space aside for the worship of God. Let's give to God our joys, our concerns, our worries, whatever it is that you're carrying with you, and open ourselves up to what God has to say to us in this space today. Let us worship the Lord. Today, your scripture reading is Psalms 15. Who may worship in your sanctuary, Lord, who may enter your presence on your holy hill. Those who lead blameless lives and do what is right, speaking the truth from sincere hearts. Those who refuse to gossip or harm their neighbors or speak evil of their friends. Those who despise flagrant sinners and honor the faithful followers of the Lord. And keep their promises even when it hurts. Those who lend money without charging interest and who cannot be bribed to lie about the innocent. Such people will stand firm forever. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of change.
Good morning, Manaway Center kids. I hope you guys are all doing well, and I hope you got a chance to play in all of the snow that we got this past week. Today begins the season of Lent in our church, which is basically just the season where we began to think about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And just like Advent, each Sunday in Lent has a theme, with today's theme being compassion. So to have compassion, it means to care about the problems of other people and trying to help with their problems, even if it doesn't specifically help you. Now, for some people, having compassion for others comes very naturally. It's just what you do and you don't even think about it. But something that we don't talk about enough is that compassion is also a skill. It's something that you can practice and you can get better at, just like doing math or playing the piano. Your compassion skills can get better with time, even if it doesn't come naturally to you, because you can practice it. So, how do we practice and work out our compassion muscles? One of the first things I'd recommend is listening to others. And I mean really listen. When someone is talking about their problems or something they're upset about, do everything you can to focus on them and hear what they're saying. I'd also really recommend trying to put yourself in other people's shoes and imagine how you'd feel if you had those same problems. So this week, I challenge you to work out your compassion muscles, listen to others and put yourself in their shoes. Will you bow your heads in prayer with me? Dear God, help us to be more compassionate. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you guys and have a great week. Sometimes people need help. Sometimes a tornado destroys an entire town. Sometimes a mother is ripped away from her children. Sometimes disaster strikes and weak of compassion is there at home and around the world. When I was four years old, my mother put me on the back of a motorcycle and told me to hold on tight. 
that was the last time I saw her. We left Vietnam in the middle of the night. Hold on tight. When we reached the end of the road, the motorcycle turned into a boat, and the Pacific Ocean became our home, until we landed in a refugee camp in Thailand. From Thailand to Cambodia to Laos, and finally to the Philippines, where we wrote letter after letter after letter, and somehow they made their way to East Dallas Christian Church. I remember the refugee camp official calling my name. I remember landing in Dallas. I remember hearing about Week of Compassion. I remember crying because I knew a new future was possible. I remember hearing my mom whisper in my ear, "Hold on tight." This is my life story. It is just one of the many stories that have been made possible by Week of Compassion. Because sometimes people need help. For over seven decades, Week of Compassion has been making new futures possible. And hold on tight, because we are just getting started. As we enter into this time of communal prayer, I invite you to find a comfortable and quiet praying position. Roll your shoulders back away from your ears. Let your feet fall flat on the floor. Relax the muscles of your spine and unclench your jaw. Take a deep breath in and out. As we go to the divine in prayer. Holy God, we come together to worship a people who would like to think that we love you with all our hearts and souls, with all our might. But there are so many other things in our lives that clamor for our attention that we often relegate you to Sundays and Wednesdays and times when we want you to rescue us. Most of us really do want you to be the one in whom we live and move and have our being. We really do want to hear your voice above all of the other voices in our lives. But we get bogged down in the daily routine. We forget who we are. We forget who you are. We forget what the church is supposed to be. So here we are, standing before you today, with our human foibles and our short attention spans, asking that you would make yourself known to us, that you would help us to recognize the presence of the holy, that you would continue to challenge us, inspire us, and make us into the people you want us to be. So open our eyes that we might see what the good Samaritan saw. Grant us the insight to see the need in others, the wisdom to know what to do, and the will to do it. And so we pray for all those who, in many and various ways, have been stripped, beaten, and left for dead. We pray for children who must grow up in the most awful of circumstances, especially for those starved of love or food or shelter or security. May they receive the future you have planned for them. We pray for those we might cross the road to avoid, who have been excluded socially because of their race, their financial status, or their history. May the dignity that is theirs be restored to them. We pray for those whose need we would rather not face up to because it requires action of us, those who suffer atrocities because of war, unjust trade rules, or oppressive governments. May the world receive a true picture of their suffering and the factors that cause it. That justice may be done. Open our eyes that we might not cross the road from human need. Give us a deep love for you, that we might see your love at work in this world, and that we might go and do likewise. Amen. Shepherd me, O God, beyond.
Hey everyone, before we get into our scripture passage today, I want to share with you that as a student in seminary, I had the joy and the challenge of being in a class with the professor Amy Jill Levine. Um, she's a famous New Testament professor and academic and expert and who also happens to be Jewish. Her um, work, her insights and knowledge um, about Jesus and about first century life have um, been invaluable to me and to so many. She challenges a lot of the anti-Semitism found in Christian interpretation of the scripture and draws um, needed attention to those issues. Um, she's written many wonderful books, but uh, the one I'll reference today is called Short Stories by Jesus. And in it, she seeks to unearth the challenging nature of Jesus' parables. Um, she really digs in deep and gives a lot of history and a lot of wonderful uh, biblical exegesis in them. So much of the thoughts in the sermon today were influenced by her reflections on this wonderful passage, and I, I would recommend her book to you as a resource um, to you on your journey of understanding the Bible um, just a little bit more. So our passage today, as we turn there, is the Good Samaritan, and it is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Listen, listen, listen for a word from God. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan while traveling came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Compassion. Over the years, if you've been a part of church communities, you've probably heard so many different interpretations of the Good Samaritan story. Chances are you've probably placed yourself in the shoes of one of the characters, maybe the one in the ditch, uh, maybe the, the Samaritan or the innkeeper, the priest or the Levite. Um, so many different ways to, to understand and see the story, and I'm sure that you, you can have your own fun in, in looking at it. Jesus' parables are so powerful because they can provide endless avenues for discussion for us and different angles to look from. So I just encourage you to keep revisiting them. Now, those listening um, to the story today, that's a, a different angle to look, look at, may have um, gladly anticipated and positioned themselves in the, in the moral position of the final helper you know, the last one to come in. You know, the priest and the Levite went by. They're too busy. They didn't want to be bothered. Who knows what was going on in their minds? But then there's, we anticipate, the regular Joe that comes on in and, and saves the day. Great story. And the crowd would just applaud. Except for Jesus, it wasn't a regular Joe. It was a, quote, 
good Samaritan? Can there be such a one as this? I mean, this would have been received by the crowd with gritted teeth. See, without going all into it, there's a lot of bad blood um, between the Samaritans and the first century Jewish folks. There have been theological and political differences. There has been a history of bitter fights and even bloodshed. There's no love lost between these groups. Now, what you have to do is think of someone or a group that just makes your skin crawl. And it's just someone that you despise. And so then if you found yourselves in a ditch, how would it feel if you looked up and saw that one, the one that you despise, looking to help you? If you, even in the state that you're in, you know, you're beaten, you're bloodied, you're left half dead, you might rather be left for dead than to be helped by the likes of this one looking at you. If you can imagine that, you might have a sense of how little folks felt about the Samaritans. They, they were enemies. So, once again, we see that this difficult teaching of Jesus to love your enemies, not in too many chapters before, it comes right back again into the listener's purview. In this story, the listener again must confront the possibility that there's good in the ones that they hate the most. See, at this point in history, it's been an endless cycle of tit for tat between the Israelites and the Samaritans. It's an endless cat and mouse game, a blood feud that may have gotten so convoluted over time that people may have forgotten who started what and when. Yet, it was palpable for them. What is it going to take to satisfy the bloodlust, satisfy their anger, their pain, their resentment towards each other? What is going to need to happen? See, the story shows something that is much bigger than this just one event, this one Samaritan and one person lying in a ditch. Professor Levine points out that perhaps Jesus was actually pointing his listeners to a seldom read or told story from 2 Chronicles 28. Yeah, so most of us uh, Bible readers today probably don't frequent um, 2 Chronicles very often, but there, right in in the story, is part of the history of hate and violence between Israel and Samaria. And you can go and read the whole thing, but basically in the Um, story they were at war with themselves and the Samaritans who were part of the of Israel at the time the Samaritans had taken captive 200,000 people from Judah and Jerusalem and they had plans to subjugate them to enslave them and so a prophet rose up Oded and he confronts them and challenges them to turn from this evil and return those captives um, to their homes now, at this point, we might expect the Samaritans to roll their eyes at, Ju- at the Judeans. I mean, maybe we bring out one of our own prophets and the, our, one of our prophets can say something bad about them. I mean, why should we show mercy to you? Why, why should we have compassion for you? All we're doing is getting back at you for what you've done to us. It is an endless cycle. So you might, we might expect the Samaritans to say that, but instead something shocking happens. The Samaritans relent. They say, okay. They listen to the prophet. So listen to what happens. This is in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15. Listen to what happens and check out how eerily similar it sounds to the actions of the Samaritan in the story of Jesus. The passage reads, Then those who were mentioned by name got up and took the captives, and with the booty they clothed all that were naked among them. They clothed them, gave them sandals, provided them with food and drink, and anointed them. And carrying all the feeble among them on their animals, their donkeys, 
They brought them to their kindred at Jericho, the city of palm trees. And then they returned to Samaria. It's a fascinating parallel. And the story tells us, as Amy Jill Levine says, the cycle of violence can be broken. The cycle of violence can be broken. And so in this action, in the story, in Second Chronicles, perhaps a new cycle instead of mercy has begun. What we might see is that acts of compassion like these can go a long way to begin to erode the anger and the hatred that has been harbored within us and within our communities. We see in Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan that a momentary action of compassion can absolutely bring healing and comfort and wholeness to the ones who are hurting the most. Christ calls us to never just pass by when there is an action we can take for the benefit of others. No doubt we can learn that. It is so good to remember that core message from Jesus. But here we can also see that compassion can have a bigger, even more far-reaching effect. Acts of compassion can show a different way. There is another way. Acts of compassion can show hope to all who give it, give them, experience them, or even observe them, give them hope that there is another way. Acts of compassion and mercy can show that the hatred and violence that has brought us to this point, whatever it may be, doesn't have to define our future together. So the question becomes, that Jesus puts before those listening and the disciples, who's going to put themselves out there? Who is going to take the risk to even be vulnerable and at least try to break that cycle? No doubt, my, my family in Christ, no doubt there is deep pain and history in our individual families that make us really uneasy to keep the door open to some no doubt there are divisions and violence of words that have created generational bitterness among even within our local community, the, our school boards, our, our family systems, whatever they are. There is generational anguish among those who have been targeted by racism and homophobia and sexism that has been so hurtful. And Lord knows there is deep animosity present right now between um, different political groups and voters. It is a very contentious time. And none of that can be minimized. It can't just be wiped away so easily. Yet, can we, can we believe that transformation is possible to hold on to that hope? To always hold on to that hope. Family of God, compassion and actions of goodwill are sometimes hard to sometimes hard both to give and receive, especially when it's with people that we dislike. But when we do them, when we do give them and when we do receive them, some of the cycles of disrespect and pain and revenge can begin to fray, can begin to fall away. And so as we move into the future, as we seek to get beyond this difficult time in so many different ways, can we take compassion with us in the way and likeness of Jesus? What would it look like to follow his way of compassion, to reflect it, to emanate it, to try to be it in the world? May we work and think and pray on these things together this Lent. May it be so. Amen.
Good morning, church, and happy Sunday. Um, this morning, we're carrying on the theme uh, from the Week of Compassion Ministry. I looked on the Week of Compassion website, and I found that the special offering for February of 2021 has a theme, and it's called Let Love Flow. Um, and they have a little passage from Isaiah 49.10 that goes along with their uh, theme. And that says, nobody hungry, nobody thirsty, shade from the sun, shelter from the wind, for the compassion one guides them, takes them to the best springs. And again, that's Isaiah 49.10. So normally when I think about week of compassion, I think of this big world and money that we send overseas. But while I was looking at the Week of Compassion website, they had several different stories where they talked about um, different entities that received Week of Compassion gifts. And I found one right here in the States. So let's hear about um, this story about North Carolina and a hurricane. And it's entitled, Let Love Flow. To be inundated is typically not a good thing. The word carries a sense of too much. Water, unnecessary for life, can at times be soothing as a gently moving river or a placid sea reflecting blue skies above. Yet it also has the power to overwhelm as when the same river overflows its banks or when an ocean surge is pushed before a storm. Too much water can inundate a riverbed, a floodplain, a surrounding community. And this is what happened in September 2018 as Hurricane Florence dropped records amounts of rainfall across North and South Carolina. Pamlico County, North Carolina was among many places where a combination of storm surge and swollen rivers led to widespread flooding. Compounded by significant wind damage across the county, the devastation was severe. More than 40% of the homes sustained significant damage, along with businesses and infrastructure. In the midst of the chaos, the staff at Camp Caroline began helping neighbors and, in and invited disciples in North Carolina to join their response. A ministry of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in North Carolina, located in Pimlico County, Camp Caroline staff did what seemed natural. Through existing relationships, they began to identify needs and solicit for help. The process and partnership continued as they connected with the Week of Compassion and Disciples Volunteering. While their early response was un unfolding, Pamlico County Disaster Recovery Coalition, which I'm going to be referring to in the rest of the story as PCDRC, was formed to offer a centralized organization for countywide recovery. Week of Com Compassion extended an operational grant to facilitate recovery coordination, and the deepening relationships soon brought other partners to the response through the Disaster Recovery Support Initiative. A second week of Compassion grant provided a 10% match necessary for PCDRC to obtain significant funds from a local foundation. The funds from Week of Compassion not only directly provided for repairs of eight households, but also provided access to funding for muckout or repair for an additional 80 homes. The cooperative relationship began between Week of Compassion, Disciples Volunteering, and PCDRC enabled them to apply together and receive two additional grants this time from Lowe's via National VOAD, Camp Caroline has hosted mission trips groups throughout the recovery. Even as the collaborative adapted to provide safe services in light of COVID-19, helping the PCDRC make the most of their available funds. Where storms surge, where storms rage, oceans surge, and rivers flood, 
The inundating power of these combined forces can be devastating. To counter such forces in recovery requires a similar communicative response. Through generosity, service, and prayer, love flows beyond the banks in Pamlico County, surging into places of need. Because of gifts given to Week of Compassion, love flows. Love, of which there can never be too much, now inundates devastated spaces and places and brings healing, hope, and recovery. So as we remember to give those Week of Compassion offering, I kind of feel like it brings us back to the table. Jesus wanted us to be those hands and feet and be out in community and service and do service with others for others. So as we remember the emblems today, let us remember that we are the hands and feet of Jesus doing this work. Will you pray with me? Lord, as we let love flow, please go with us this week, knowing that we can do your good works out in our communities and beyond. Amen. Will you pray the Lord's Prayer with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a good week, church. And we recall as we gather around the Lord's table that on the night of Jesus' betrayal and arrest, as he shared a meal with his friends, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. He passed it among his followers, saying, Share this bread among you. This is my body, which will be broken for justice. Do this to remember me. When supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, passed it to his disciples, saying, Share this wine among you. This is my blood, which will be shed for liberation. Do this to remember me. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we experience again the presence of Jesus in our midst, the table is ready, my friends. All are welcome. Come, for the feast is spread, and all means all.
Thank you so much for joining us here at Manaway Center this week for worship. You could have chosen many other things to do with your time, and we appreciate and are blessed by your choice to spend it here with us. Don't forget that you can come and join us for a rousing discussion and fellowship immediately following this service if you're watching the premiere on YouTube. We would love to hear your questions and comments as well as getting to see your face on the screen. Check your emails for the Zoom link from Pastor Chad and we'll see you there. Our benediction this morning comes from Reverend Barclay at Enfleshed Liturgy That Matters. So much has been hidden to protect narratives and people, to disempower, to confuse. Unsatisfied with stories that get us by, but never get us free. May we be people who look beyond, who listen beneath, who feel through and through. Though we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, we do not grow weary in faith. Though evil shrouds our view with each new learning and unlearning, the partial fades away. The histories and complicities and losses and power of our tangled lives cry out for understanding. With courage, we open ourselves to the truth. With humility, we endeavor to be transformed. With hope, we hold on to each other. May love lead us in the sacred work of unveiling. May all that shrouds justice be uncovered and the ways of healing revealed. May it be so, church. Amen.